Hello. Hello, in the office. <laughs> yeah. I think I saw Matt. Hey, Matt. Monica. Awesome. Good, interesting people coming uh, G'day. in. Excellent. I'm sort of excited because we're hoping to start going back into our office from working at home next week. Um, we'll see, assuming the, the, the all the rules don't change on us. Currently, it's not it's not possible. Indeed, indeed. Um, so yeah, but you know, as uh, we we were in these really dynamic, interesting external circumstances, got to do the best we can with it. So um uh, everyone as everyone's uh, starting to log in and thank you very much for being super on time i'm just i'm going to relatively quickly get into the content um and look before i start super formally i'm just going to start talking about in general why we're running this session uh, we've run a number of webinars um this year sort of really ramped them up during the um uh, COVID crisis and I think one of the most common points of discussion when we were hearing from really interesting entrepreneurs about their stories or discussing a particular uh, issue whether that's resilience or, or how best to market yourself and all of that sort of thing one of the things that did keep coming up was these discussions about customers and what they needed uh, these discussions around um, I know my customer could benefit from this but they don't quite see it that way you know, lots and lots of conversations like that. And so we I thought, right, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you one, some of the key tool sets to answer that in a bit more depth than just little answers as part of those discussions. So that's the first reason I wanted to run this webinar. And the second one is um, if you ask me to nominate the most common big issue I see with innovation companies, um, a, a lack of depth of understanding of your customer is the number one most common thing I see that's really causing problems for entrepreneurs in innovative businesses. Uh, you, you know, um, as we talk through what and why, hopefully that'll what I mean by that will start to make a bit more sense. Um, but just bear it in mind, this is a really common issue. We, you know, when people talk about difficulties with innovation and barriers and stuff like that. Um, there's lots of them. The one that tends to dominate on the entrepreneur side, because there's lots of things you can't do anything about, but what you, on the entrepreneur side where you can do something about it is you can act to um, understand, have more new insights about the people you can benefit. Uh, the people who pay, who benefit are called customers. Anyway, so I think everyone should be pretty much logged in by now. So I'm just, um, I'm just going to, um, starting with our formal content. So welcome everyone, um, finding customer needs. It's a one hour webinar. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to move very quickly to cover a bunch of stuff. Uh, my name's Craig Davis. Uh, I run the growth programs here at the Canberra Innovation Network. Um, I've got a background as a scientist, an entrepreneur, um, and in the, in the last five years, done a lot of um, mentoring, angel investing, and running programs for entrepreneurs. Uh, Irene also is um, really going to be helping me out today. Introduce yourself quickly, Irene. Hey everyone, my name is Irene. I work with Craig uh, at the Canberra Innovation Network, um, mostly around the workshop programs um, and helping really uh, early stage uh, entrepreneurs uh, progress their ideas to the next level. Great, and we'll tell you about a couple of other programs that we're about to run at the end of the webinar. Um, basic notes, uh, I think most of you will be familiar with this do please put your video on, put it in gallery view. I'll have slides on, but you can expand out the gallery view on the side. So I want you to see each other's faces and feel like you're part of a group um, to, to, to slightly mimic that thing that happens when we're, when we're in a room. Um, please open the chat window, ask questions, comment, whatever you like in the chat. We'll, uh, uh, Irene will monitor that and we'll really make an effort to respond all, to anything you put up in the chat. Uh, and especially if there's something you don't understand or you disagree with, if you think I'm full of crap, tell me. 
right? Put it in the chat. Don't be shy. There's no such thing as a, a as a bad question. Um, do, and then I think we can um, we'll we'll have a great time. Um, we will record the webinar for those who can't um, do it right now. Uh, so what are we going to do today? We're gonna I'm gonna really do three things. We're gonna talk four things. We're gonna talk about why. We're gonna just have a bit of a discussion, and I'm gonna in, first ask for some input from you. But really, the question is why? What does this mean? Why is understanding customer needs hard? Or, or some people might think it isn't hard. Yeah, I'm happy to have that conversation. Then we're going to introduce three key principles, and then I'm going to show you two methods. Um, we'll get a little bit of time to interact on them, and then some time to have a quick discussion, answer any questions, and hopefully get you thinking, oh, I might try something new. That's all I want. That's, that's the outcome I'm after. I'm after you saying, hmm, maybe, maybe that is something I could do a little bit of. Have a try. I want you to try it for yourself. We don't, in one hour, we don't have time to really practice it in the webinar, uh, which we love to in our full workshops. Uh, but I hope that you're inspired to just try uh, something a bit new. So let's, let's, let's really leap in now and um, um, uh, I want to ask you to comment in the chat. Um, or, or you can turn on microphone and say it out loud if you want to. Um, do you agree with me that understanding customer needs is hard? Uh, if you don't, that's fine. Tell me. If you do, why is it hard? Anyone want to start that conversation? <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Some customers don't understand their needs. So, and, and you say even some, Peter, uh, actually, it's really common. The, the customers don't really understand their own needs. They understand their world. Um, they, 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 they understand lots of things, but, but they can't necessarily articulate it to you. Um, uh, so really good points. Um, um, uh, Serena says, you don't think it's hard, just different. Good point. Good point. Let's identify the barriers that are that are that you need to be different about, and that's really sort of going to be my key message. So maybe you're already on that, Serena. Uh, Jackie said, "You're not in their head, right? It's hard to get into someone's head. Um, the, we what you're trying to do is really what we call empathy, right? You're trying to understand their world. To understand a customer's world is to then have insights, uh, and that's not easy." human beings can't mind read each other and that sort of stuff. So we try to understand them. Um, um, uh, somebody said very bluntly, buyers are liars. Um, well, that, that's a saying in the, in the sort of the sales area, right? Uh, and it comes from situations where you say, so, uh, so do you, you know, do you want my pen? Oh, look, I would love to Craig, uh, but I'm a bit short of cash at the moment. Right, and, and, and everyone knows that that's just a white lie to, 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 to make it more polite to say no, right? And, and people do that, that's an exaggerated example, but it's actually a very real thing. Um, so people don't, let me put it into my language, uh, people are not necessarily going to tell you the truth, the, the deeper truth that you would like to know about. Uh, and, and there's a couple of reasons for that that we're gonna deal with later. Uh, but they can, as, as John said, they can struggle to articulate. They might have a, you know, um, um, uh, they might, yeah, they might, um, yeah, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, because Serena, I've just read Serena's made a really good comment. Uh, she did a, a, an online poll on a Facebook group about, you know, and the people come back saying what they wanted was very different than what she thought, right? And I want to tell you, that's the magic moment. When you hear some, when you, when you hear what you expected to hear, I'm not excited. When you hear something that's it's like, what's going on here? That's exciting. That's when you're getting value. That's when you're learning something new about those people, right? Doesn't mean necessarily we're going to go through that poll and say, aha, now I know the answer, the new answer. It might be a bit more subtle than that, 
um, customer needs change and differ from customer to customer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's usually in any given industry, there's a wide range of people. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, uh, customers confused between their needs and their wants. Yes. And if you ask somebody what they need, they will often tell you what they want. Uh, they'll often tell you what they might desire. Um, and instead of solving their transport need, you're going to hear about um, the Lamborghini they'd like to be driving. But if you gave them a Lamborghini, they wouldn't like it because it doesn't go over the speed humps, right? So, you know, you've got to be really careful about that one. So that's really good comments. Um, um, uh, George has said, and it's really important, they don't know what they want, right? And, and, you know, people often talk in this area about the Henry Ford comment. You know, if I'd asked people what they want, they'd have said a faster horse and buggy. Uh, but I gave them a car instead. They didn't know that they needed a car because cars didn't really exist or weren't yeah, accessible to most people. Um, yes, if you're doing innovation, you're doing something new, they don't know that they need what you've got because they don't know about it. You're the expert in the innovation, not them. So um, that, that's really important. Um, um, Sorry, I'm just trying to read through all these comments. So many good ones, so many good ones. Um, it's, John said, it's our responsibility to help them to articulate needs, having converted needs, wants to needs. So that's, John, that's exactly the outcome I'm after here, which is to understand the needs, the problems, the pain points, the difficulties in my customer's world, to have insights into their world and to then translate that into an offering that they really want. It might be the exact product I already had, but I'm telling about it differently. And we'll come to that. We call it value proposition and we'll mention it briefly at the end of this webinar. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Look, I think, I think we've probably covered most of the main reasons why it's hard to understand customer needs, but there's one really big one. Um, that I'm going to call out that I haven't heard from anyone. Uh, and, and it's hard to understand customer needs if you don't interact with customers. Now it might, I hope that that sounds strange to most of you, but my experience is that it won't because a lot of people spend a lot of time developing products, working on their business and doing everything, but talking to their customers. Um, you can't learn from them if you're not engaging with them. It's a, so bear that in mind. We're going to come back to it. Uh, Irene, are there any other key barriers that we should have covered here? No, I think um, you've covered most of the, the points uh, around, you know, empathy. I love the quote of buyers are lies. Actually, is that the first time I've heard of it? Um, and kind of, yeah, it's a bit blunt, but kind of speaks to the point. So yeah, I think we're good to move on. Yeah, fantastic. And I'll, I'll probably just add to that. Why, why are entrepreneurs often not talking to customers? Because they're afraid. We worry. But they might say no. They might say, I hate your idea. They might not buy our product. It's sort of scary. It's sort of scary. We've got a tactic to help you pass that one. Um, Oh, look, I will say uh, Jackie said lived experience of a, of a product or service. And this is, this is really important. And many of you will have lived experience. You might have been in the industry. You might have been the customer. You might have been the person in the role that you're now wanting to sell back to because you understand that industry and you've come up with new innovations that that industry needs. Fantastic. And it brings a lot of strengths with it. But I'm going to tell you really bluntly, that's not enough. Having that lived experience is excellent. It's really helpful, but I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you to do a bit more. Um, oh, uh, Zeholtz has said, we know our product, but the customer doesn't. That's the difficulty, isn't it? We know they would benefit from it, but they don't. How are we going to, how are we going to resolve that really fundamental challenge? Look, Let's bear these challenges in mind. Let's bear these difficulties in mind and 
um, and think about the opportunity if we can understand, get new insights into our customers' world. And uh, let's, let's now talk a little bit about some methods. Um, so I've just, I've just sort of um, summarized it here on this slide. Um, and th this is now my personal opinion. It's my personal opinion that's come from interacting with 1200 entrepreneurs. We've got 1200 entrepreneurs in my CRM that, that we've, and it doesn't even count the ones I didn't put the notes in. Um, the, the single most powerful thing which helps entrepreneurs to get their product into adoption is more customer insights. Okay. Uh, the second thing is I'll say, and it's sort of summarizing that discussion a bit, uh, it's challenging, it's scary. And I guess probably didn't really emphasize this. We can be easily misled. People will tell us things. Um, remember my little widget? We're afraid that somebody will say it's a bad idea, but actually what, what will much more likely happen in Australian culture is I'll say, hi, Irene, look at my, look at my great widget. And she'll say, what a lovely idea, Craig. Aren't you a genius? Did I get any customer insight through that conversation? Is it really true? I doubt it. I doubt it. As high an opinion as I have of myself, I'm not actually a genius about this commodity viro. Uh, does that make sense? Um, so now here's, let's, let's actually introduce some principles that are going to help us to do this. And the first one, some of these are going to sound a bit obvious to you, but trust me, it means something. The first principle of understanding customer needs is customers are people. And I want you to reframe everything as people and not demographics, not statistics. You need statistics. It's a thing. Don't get me wrong. Market research is a powerful tool, but for this purpose, I want you to focus on people and not demographics and not companies. You're not interested in an insight into a company you're interested into insights in the people in that company who will adopt your solution does that make sense people now the 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 clever trick here is once we're thinking about people we need to think about two things where do i find them and what makes them different you can see some images on this page it's very easy to describe those uh, people in a, in, a, in a demographic way, you know, uh, males between ages of 55 and 65. It doesn't get, it, it's not helping. Anyone want to give, tell me, tell me a better way of describing these people? Where would I find them? The football players, maybe masters football players. It's dark, maybe they're playing after work. Jackie you, or Josh, where am I gonna find them? At the field, right? It's, it's powerful. It's powerful because we're understanding their world. They're people who go to the football field, right? And we can start to think why, when, etc. cetera. But, but also, if I know they go to that football field, I can go to that football field and talk to them. And that's the most powerful thing of all because we need to talk to people. So principle number one, I'm not going to dwell on it too long, but I want everyone to be thinking of people, right? If you want to sell a, a, a service to a, a mining company, that's not a person. Who's going to adopt it? Is it the safety engineers? Is it the underground manager engineer? Is it, who is it? There are people in that organization. There are roles that that's, that are very distinct and they're the people we need to engage with and understand. Sometimes in a big co company, we need to, there might be a range of different people who need to be convinced. Good. Understand them all. Any questions on that? Does it make sense? People. Let's keep moving. Uh, principle number two is that we focus on problems, not solutions. And 
it's really powerful to understand people are better at telling you their problems than they are telling you what they would like to have. They don't really know what they would like to have. You're the innovator, not them, but they're generally much better at saying what they don't like. What are they struggling with? What bugs them? What, what's, what's causing a problem in their life? What's their biggest challenge? If you can understand those things, you can offer them a solution to the, to those challenges or problems, and they're going to be much more likely to adopt. People adopt solutions to their problems. Now I want to really emphasize these are problems. The person has not problems. The world has not problems that you know about, but problems they know about. You want them to say in their words, I hate it that. I have to have a, I can't, I need to do this thing that I currently struggle with. Does that make sense? When we talk about problems, we're, we're, we're often really tend to think of the problem, which is the world could be a better place, right? That's the deep thing you're trying to, to do as an innovator is make the world a better place. Right. Um, um, I, 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 I think climate change is a really big example of that. Um, we can understand that the world has a problem with climate change. There's too much carbon emissions. It's changing the atmosphere, climate change. It's bad. We, are, we, we all get that, right? Um, if I've got a climate change initiative, I've got a way of capturing carbon or reducing emissions. Who's the person who's going to adopt that? You know, is it a car manufacturer who should change from, from um, a, a diesel engines to more efficient engines, right? Is that your, now, what is it their need? Their need might be, I need to sell cars and I'm worried that people won't buy my old fuel inefficient cars. Well, that's a problem. You're solving it. I want you to, in that example though, I want you to just, because it's, it's a bit political, very politically charged, that's a good example where people don't necessarily say what they really think, especially publicly. So what's, what's the blurb on the car manufacturer's website say about how environmental they are? You go talk to the actual people in that company and find out what's really going on. That's then your opportunity to get them to make change. Does that make sense? Solve problems that people have. Find people, solve problems that people have. All right, we're getting, we're getting along nicely. Um, um, I, think, I think not seeing any glazed eyes, you didn't get it, hopefully. Do, do interrupt, do put something on the chat um, or speak up if there's something that doesn't like. Um, principle number three, and it sort of brings it all together which is we have to test our ideas. We, we're gonna test ideas about people by talking to people. So first thing is, just be, it does it regardless of how experienced you are in a sector, it's, it's very likely that there's things you think are true that aren't true. You've got to test your ideas. And the more you, we're talking about innovation and new things, the more uncertainty is and more we need to test 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 um can everyone see a little picture of uh this puppy beautiful puppy isn't it lovely puppy right um i know it's beautiful i don't even need to ask you about that it just is why would i bother even testing this idea what a beautiful puppy in fact, it would be better if I don't ever show that puppy to anyone because then there's no prospect that anyone ever will say, oh, I don't need your puppy. Does that make sense? So the analogy I'm drawing there is your ideas are like puppies. You've been developing your idea, you've been developing your product, product your, your innovative solution. You love it, it's beautiful. It becomes like a puppy. You just want to pet it. Stay at home. I've got a lovely puppy. That's not going to test your ideas. And if when you show it to people, you say, haven't I got a lovely puppy? 
Are you going to learn anything? No. They're just going to say, yes, Craig, nice puppy. Didn't learn anything. This is not somebody who's going to buy my company, my product. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen people show innovative products to customers. The customers have said, fantastic, I'll definitely buy that. And then they didn't. Monica said earlier, buyers are liars. It's a bit of a crude phrase, but it's sort of true. Um, um, how do you get past that? How do you prevent, how do, I, how do I find out whether you want a new puppy in your life? Do I show you a puppy and say, surely you want that? No, I ask you about, got any pets? Got companionship in your life? I don't know, find an angle like that. Does that make sense? So we need to test our ideas because we mislaid ourselves. Um, um, and as Alyssa's just said on the chat, you, you have to really let go of your own assumptions, challenge your own assumptions. Just because you think this product is perfect and what everyone needs, um, well, let's challenge that. And here's the, here's, the great, here's the great news. When you do that, your product gets better. So. Uh, on that one, Craig. Sure. Um, now, on testing your ideas, so obviously we, when you're developing your product or reiterating on your product, um, and you should obviously go talk to your customers, um, how frequently, so you, you test and you reiterate um, or, or talk to them, reiterate, at what stage, like mid-reiteration or mid-testing, like or developing, should you then test again and then keep testing? And what would you consider to be a relevant sample size? Like how many people sure, do you want to sure. talk to? So look, and, and, and um, two questions there really. Uh, how much should I test? How should I, should I stop at some point? And, and, and honestly, the answer is just keep at it. Now you might have an intensive period of testing. I really, I really need to really get a core understanding here. Um, and I'll talk, and that's often what we're most focused on, right? But I want you to keep doing that afterwards. Just get into the habit of always doing this because uh, there's always some new idea to test. There's always a, a new type of customer. There's always a new potential market. There's always a new upgrade to your product around the corner. So always be doing this. So the, the, the simple, easy answer is just keep doing it. But, but what you're really saying is I've got a particular... Um, key idea I want to test. How do I know if, if I'm on the right path or not? Have I tested it enough? Um, somewhere between 10 and 100 conversations, right? Um, and what typically happens is after several conversations, you start to get a clear idea that we're heading in the direction and then you test it harder. Or you go, no, nah, there was just no interest there at all. We're going to test something else. And you've got to do that cycle again and again. Um, and um, we see between 50 and 100 conversations, there's usually a big step change in our understanding. And it, it does take many conversations. You know, it's, it, it, it doesn't have to be big market research statistics. I've, done a th I've got a thousand uh, surveys, but we really 10 and 100, between 10 and 100 is sort of the, the really rough sweet spot. Does that make sense? Um, that, was, that was sort of the key key thing I was after. Yeah, it's like, like because obviously you, you could talk to five people, and those five people might say no. But then if you've mm -hmm. spoken to yeah, fifty people, you might get a fifty percent. Well, yes, that's right. Say, yes, that 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 is right. But um, if you talk to five people and they're all not showing the pain point that you thought they did, right? Mm -hmm. What I'm going to encourage you is think, and then you start talking to some other people and they do, right? What I'm going to encourage you to do is think, well, what's different between those two groups of people, right? Are they different elements within, right? That's where we, we sort of go from 55 year old males to, um, to the guys playing rugby. And maybe there's a subset within those guys playing rugby at night. I don't, you know, that's what you're looking for. A big part of what you're looking for is actually to target in on the, the subset of all people who can be your customers who are going to be your early customers. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, and you keep, you know, and, and, and um, um, 
Is that Matt instead of Monica? I think it might be you, Matt, logged in with Monica's account, but that's okay. Um, it's all about um, you, keep, you keep doing this and you will find new insights and you will start asking different questions. You will get better at it and you will find new sophisticated insights. We just see that every time people really engage in this process, they start to find new insights. And the more you do it, the more you get better at it. Typically, we run this as what I'm introducing to you today is usually a three and a half hour in-person workshop. Uh, we'll, do a, we'll do three, four cycles of role play interviews. And on the third cycle, you're like, oh, it's surprising how much I learned here. Right? And, and just get better and better at it. Um, uh, John's talked about the on prime 100 uh, conversations target. Um, he's seen the results of it. I've seen the re results of it. We've done seven cohorts of on prime. Uh, we will tell you about uh, the idea to impact program, which is coming up in um, September, uh, where there will be the same target. As part of the workshop program, your, ta your, your task will be to talk to 100 con customers. By the way, if you think, if you think that, um, 100 customers is not possible in your particular area. These on teams are scientists, deep technical innovations. They're, it's really common that half of them turn up on the first day and say, look, there's six people in the world who need this. Our average is 80 or 90. It really can be done. It really can be done. Um, it's out there and it, and it does help, right? Um, does that make sense? So look, maybe, maybe let's try and make it a little bit more realer. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something slightly scary, which is I'm gonna ask for volunteers and I'm gonna ask somebody to tell me who, who, that, who they would like to talk to, right? And then I'm gonna get you to role play that person. D does that make sense? We just can have a quick conversation and we'll then talk about what happened. Um, so, does anyone Helia. want to put themselves? Helia wants to put herself forward? Yep. She's Great. Okay, Helia. So um, turn on your mic and then tell yes. me um, who do you want me to find out about? Who, who, who do you want to role play as a customer? Okay. Um, should I start with the pitching the product or service or give, give start a, just telling uh, me? Uh, just uh, give a very quick summary of the general idea. Don't give me any details. Okay, um, I need someone with um, lots of energy use. It could be household, yep. it could yep. be a business. Okay. Um, and you can help them reduce their energy use? Yes. And why do you think they're gonna mainly adopt that? To save um, money on their bills or? Um, I, well, well the, 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 the value proposition is saving money on their bill, but we're also looking into um, some um, environmental benefit too. Okay. But I think the saving is better. Yeah. Well, so, so we like to think about that person, have a bit of an idea of what we think their pain points are, right? Mm. Um, so now, so Helia, can you role play for me for a bit? Um, you're, um, uh, you're the owner of a restaurant, a small restaurant mm -hmm. business, right? Does that make sense? Yep, sure. I know, I know that restaurants use lots of energy. Okay, and so I'm gonna to say to you, uh, let's just have, so that's all you need to know. You be that person for just a couple of minutes and we'll see what happens. Hi, Hilly, you've got a couple of minutes. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about your energy usage. I know you're a restaurant owner, is that okay? I'm gonna say yes, but um, I've worked with a restaurant owner and probably they say I'm too busy. I'm really busy, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, and if somebody says they're too busy, what do you say? You say, um, I probably ask them when would be the best time for them to talk. Beautiful. Would there be a time when just, I only need five minutes. When would be a time that would be suitable? Right. And if they just say, Oh, never, what they're saying is I don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. We have to accept that feedback. Uh, and by the way, I've already learned something, haven't I? What did I learn? Uh, that if I say energy usage to a small business owner, they're not interested. Okay. They're not interested enough to make five minutes of their time. That's a feedback. It's not the feedback we wanted to hear, but it's a feedback. Let's role play a bit further and just uh, assume this person is willing to talk to me for five minutes. So Helia, um, do you know how much energy your um, 
Or do you know the do you know the amount of your um, Bill? energy bills? Mm, yeah, it is around five thousand dollar per um, month, or yep. I don't know, three months. Okay. Um, so, well, that's a lot of money. Have you ever have you ever done anything to try and reduce that? Okay, we, I have done this uh, mm -hmm. test, so I know the answer. Yeah, we turn off the lights at night. You turn off the lights at night. Anything else? Not really. Is there anything else? Do, the, you, I, I, first, I want to understand your problems. Um, what about the, um, the okay. fridges and the cookers? Do you do anything with them? Well, we have someone who comes and tests that they work correctly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, okay. Every a few months. Okay. Um, but you haven't done anything other than that? No. Okay. Hilia, I did say it would be a very quick conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, unless there's any other question you'd like to ask me. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. So let's now let's talk about that quick conversation. What, what, what do you think happened? Was I talking to somebody who was about to buy my product? No. You were just getting the idea what, what sort of experience they had. Sure. And, and, and so what did we hear? That they, look, good news. They knew their amount of their electricity bill. Right? Yeah. Right? It's big enough that it's got some attention of them. But have they done anything about it? Mm, no. Not really. Nothing at all. They didn't say, oh, I tried this and it didn't work. And I, I told the staff to turn off the lights at night, but they wouldn't. And so I'm trying to figure out how to get them to do it. I didn't hear any struggle. Does that make sense? Yep. This is, I heard passivity. And when someone's passive about the status quo, it's, it's pretty hard to get them to change. Right? Now, does that mean Healy should give up on those customers? No. No, no, no. She's, but you've got to, going to have to be creative, Helia, and think of other parts of that type of business's world where there might be pain points that really get them to act. I don't know what it might be. It doesn't. It might not be money. Okay. It could be the environment. Could be customers complaining. Their customers complaining about something. Uh, you know, I don't know. And you just want to be always listening for them to say something that sort of surprises you. Um, so, Jackie, you've made you've you've, you've opened up, a, and Jackie's opened up a really important question. Um, you need a bit of value proposition, or they'll be sceptical, right? So, um, yes and no, yes and no. There's sometimes we have to tell them the value proposition to even get to talk to them but I try to avoid it. I try to avoid it uh, because then we're going into, do they like it or not? Which is a useful thing, don't you? And we're gonna to come to pitch method in a minute. Uh, but actually, in a second, I'm gonna give you a rule that says, try not to talk about your innovation to start with. Because if you're not talking about your puppy, you're more likely to learn about their pet needs. Does that make sense? We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens in a sec. Uh, sorry, um, and you've said, you know, yeah, give it away, right? There's, there's many examples I can think of where there's products that would literally save customers money at no effort. It's simple. Well, they don't adopt them. It's sort of annoying, but that's the way it is. It's hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, and sometimes free things are hard to, uh, to sell. I uh, yeah, so I think what you're saying, Jackie, is we've got to show a benefit to the person of the conversation. Yeah, why why, why should you give me five minutes, right? And and no, no, seriously, seriously. And one of the arts is to start to understand your customers and find out what it is uh when you int can introduce yourself that will make them want to talk to you. Right? Does that does that make sense? Um and um yeah, kind of, but um, I think Saul so, so mentioned a, a bit earlier about, you know, could, um, let me find it. So, yeah, oh, if you think, yeah, they're going to think that you're, you're someone wanting to 
them to switch energy providers. So yeah, and that could, that's absolutely. This is a, this is actually um, can I uh, anyone who messaged it there is that okay if I talk to you afterwards? I don't want to take this class's time, but sure, sure, I sure. really want to know, see your insights, individual, okay. and Absolutely. do the same thing that we're learning here with you. <laughs> Look, um, so Helia, please put your contact details on the chat. What you're happy to share, and people and 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 people can put theirs, and just and, and or you can chat directly to somebody as well, right? And say however you choose to do that. Share information. Say I'd love to talk to you later right and if you that's the right attitude let's find out more right um you know somebody said maybe that uh, no tor said maybe they think you're trying to get them to switch energy providers so what's happening there is that person's got a preconception There's, they've got something in their mind they think that you're doing this right so if that's the case let's find out if it is if that's the case then tors have a useful insight because now we can use that insight and introduce ourselves differently. I'm not here to talk about energy providers. I'm, or I know that people are always trying to get you to switch bills. Um, I've, got a, I've got a really deeper innovative solution, right? Um, you know, um, uh, there's Ben from ANU, right? Uh, AN, technology that's come out of this ANU inventor, right? You can use a name like that and it sometimes gets people attention. Sometimes doesn't. Try it. See. D does that make sense? Um, um, Sarah said he's cold calling the own, only method, right? So I sort of presented that as a cold call or as a drop in, right? Um, um, there, there are many ways to get that conversation. It doesn't always have to happen. To have to be a cold call. One of the other ways that's really accessible to, to many people is to find conferences or industry get togethers, right? And there might be lots of people there and they're sort of in conversational mode, right? Um, and instead of talking about the weather, you say, oh, you're from ACTU. You can do this at our events. Um, oh, you're from ACTU. I just wanted to ask you about how you deal with this situation or, or what's your challenge with? Does that make sense, right? The trick to this is always be looking for those conversations and insights. Oh, great, Healy's uh, posted her LinkedIn connection. Connect with her, message her by LinkedIn. Most of you would have LinkedIn accounts. It's a really useful tool. Um, now, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, unbeknownst to me, I clicked to the next slide already. Here's my four rules, five. I can't count. Um, we learn from customers. The initial phase of learning from customers is by asking open-ended questions. Try not to make it a yes, no question. We'll get to that later. Get them to tell us a story. How did you? When was the last time you? The more specific you can make it, the better. Um, try not to mention your solution because it really colors the way they react. Listen for problems. Right. Think about when you're talking to people who might adopt your um, solution, your innovation, just I want each of you to think of the last few times you were talking to a customer or potential customer who talked the most. I bet it was you. When I observe entrepreneurs talking to potential customers, it's usually 75% the entrepreneur talking, 25% listening. I want it the other way around. You, try, you, you treat it as a successful conversation if the person you're talking to, not like me today, I'm just talking, 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 but if, you, if they speak much more than you do, right, if you ask a couple of little questions and they start telling you all about, oh, there's this thing, I wish I could reduce my uh, uh, energy usage, Helia, but my landlord won't do this. And let me tell you why that landlord's an idiot, right? That's, that's somebody who's got some pain points. Does that make sense? Um, uh, as somebody already said, you need to do it a fair bit. Do it a lot and count the results. Count the results, right? I want a number. I spoke to this many people and I want notes on these people were you know, super, super excited by the idea or super upset by the pain point I think they've got. 
Does that make sense? You got to be very few people have the sort of accurate memory that they will really accurately recall exactly what happened without having notes. It might be um, worth jumping in. Yeah, I've uh, got a couple of um, comments in the chat totally. about really, sales. Re yeah, really good, really good question, Helia. When does this turn into a sales call? So sometimes when we're selling, we do something very similar. We've got a product that we really want to sell, but instead of saying, here it is, do you want to buy it? We say, I just want to understand if you need this. Do you have this? Do you have that? In sales methodology, that's called qualifying your prospect. And they understand, are they actually a fit to your product? You don't want someone to buy it who can't use it. Check. Listen to them. And then it can, that, that's, that can actually be a sales methodology. Uh, sometimes, just doing this conversation turns into a sales. They say, uh, tell me what you're doing. Can I buy it, right? Sometimes that happens. Good. Um, but I personally, I think the best answer is what Jackie has said. The sale is getting an answer. The sale is learning something. Right now, in this context, you want to learn something, right? And if you learn that that person really might be your customer, then call them back later or go back later and say, now I've got the product for you. It's $1,000, are you in? All right, and we'll come to that in a second. Um, uh, Matt said, build lists, record it. Um, numbers, numbers are powerful. Numbers are powerful. I've made it very personal. I want you to have these personal things, but in the end, that's got to add up to lots of numbers or you won't have a viable business. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, so I've just done that little role play, um, and here's a couple of here's a couple of a couple more prompting ideas of how to have those conversations. Um, read off the screen, but I like to get people to talk about something specific. Can you tell me the last time? How did you? Get people to tell a story about what they do. And, and the more you do this, the more you know about those potential customers, the more you can ask really interesting questions, right? This is just the starting point. You have to tailor it into your, um, your situation, right? It's not just follow the formula. I'm gonna talk briefly about what we call the trap of mixed results, very briefly. If you talk to people and they sort of like, yeah, sort of, yeah, you're right actually, Helia, my energy bill is a bit high. I'm gonna call that mixed and it's not as strong. Just be really self-honest about that where you're at, right? If, you, if you're getting a warm signal rather than a hot signal, be honest about that's where we're at, what are you gonna do about it? This, this is just about self-honesty being really, really clear. It's, it's harder than it sounds. I'm going to come back to some people said, I want to show the solution. We call that the second stage of customer understanding, which is, and we call that pitch method, right? And if you think you know what they need, you should offer it to them. And then that gives you a new set of insights. But remember the puppies. So I'm going to give you four rules about how you do that to learn, to maximally learn from customers when you offer them a solution. This is different than trying to close a sale, although it can lead to that. Um, when you maximally wanna learn, you need to do four things. Firstly, you need to make a really resistible offer, right? If you, do, if you say to somebody, um, um, uh, we'll use Healy as example, uh, you know how you pay $5,000 a month on electricity? Well, how'd you like it to be zero? And, and I'll pay it for you. And, uh, and, act, and by the way, I'll, I'll cook the food in your restaurant as well. All right. it's, not, it's not credible, right? It needs to be simple, believable, and what you can do soon. Not what you'll be able to do 10 years from now or five years from now. It's what you can do soon. The simple, basic, resistible offer. It needs to be simple, right? If I tell you 10 reasons why you should buy my product and you say, yes, which reason mattered? You don't know. Keep it really, really simple. You need to, what we call request currency. 
Will you buy that? It's $10. Name a price. That price could be, will you sign up to my beta? You know, that sort of stuff, but have, you're asking them to act. Don't just ask them to nod and smile. Yeah, that's nice. Because otherwise you don't learn anything. And then the fourth rule is actually one of the toughest things to do. You tell this simple, basic, resistible offer very quickly, ask for something, and then you must stop and listen. Many of you may know how to do this, but I'll tell you it's extremely common that entrepreneurs can't stop at that point. You feel nervous. You don't want there to be a silence. You have to stop and the next person to speak must be the customer and they say what they say. And usually they're going to ask you a question actually. They won't just say no. They'll say, what about? The question is the gold. What did they ask about? Was the sort of question that means they really want to buy it or not? So we've just quickly skipped across the pitch method, but I just really wanted you to know about those rules. When you are pitching something, if you want to learn, you've got to, you've got to really minimize it down. Be very specific and you've got to stop and listen. Uh, at the end of that, you end up with, I'm sure somebody mentioned it already, value proposition. I like to, I like to, to be able to say a value proposition in my customer's words, as they would say it. As up this sort of person, how would they describe themselves? I need your solution, what is it? So that I can do this. And there's a fourth element, which is really critical, which is that it must be better than alternatives. That sort of makes sense. That's when, 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 when you can, when you have people saying it like that and they're excited about it, you've got an innovative pro product that's ready to grow. <coughs> so I hope I've given you a bit of a taste for why it's important to have more understanding about your customers. I've shown you three principles and two methods that I hope will give you some better ability to learn from them. Remember people, 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 people is the, the core of everything. I want to learn from, I want to listen to people. Um, and I hope, and it's been our experience that people who do that, who really pay attention, who evolve their ideas, their understanding of who the customer should be, um, benefit greatly in terms of getting innovative products to market. Does anyone have any questions about that? Hi, Craig. Um, is there any difference for a B2B context? So yeah, within an organisation, you're, you're targeting your customer that can actually buy may differ from the person who actually uses it or benefit. Okay, so you're quite right. I keep saying the word customer and customer is, is a person who uh, pays for your product, but you really need to think of the users and other stakeholders in exactly the same way. D does that sort of answer your question? And you might, categorize, you might say people like this are going to pay, right? If I'm selling to business, it might be, the CFO is going to pay or they're going to decide or, or sometimes there's going to be a committee of three people who makes a big purchasing decision, right? But then in that organisation, there's going to be um, a person who evaluates the product, who understands it, who wants it to succeed. Then there's going to be a person who helps drive adoption of it. And then there's going to be a bunch of people who actually use it. I would encourage you to talk to all of those categories of people and hope to find good understanding of all of their needs. Does that make sense? There's no good if the, if the boss buys it because you're good at convincing the boss, but nobody of it guess cares. This is not success, right? It won't lead to further customers. You won't be able to say, look at that company, see how what, well they adopted my product. Does that make sense? That's, that's absolutely the case. And but my experience is that the challenge of getting the users and the people who adopt the product um, and want it mm -hmm. uh, are not those who will pay for it. You know, they're in a different p and And the um, challenge of getting uh, those two things to line up is usually. 
Yeah, absolutely. And see this value proposition on the screen. I want you yeah. to think that that would be a completely different value proposition for those different groups of people. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So there might be somebody, um, you know, the field inspector on the ground and they really like your product because it saves them time or it prevents them from having to do a tedious administrative task that they hate. Their mm -hmm. boss might love it because it saves money, right? Mm -hmm. Their boss's boss might love it because yeah. it sounds good in a press release. Yeah, it could be dumb, but yeah. very different. Does that make Absolutely. sense? Yeah, thank you. That's good. Um, Alyssa's asked, can we have some more detail on pitch method? I'm, I'm sort of out of time to explain it more. Uh, we will send the slides around to anyone who does a feedback for us and we love everyone to give us feedback, please do. Um, and we run workshops that are dedicated entirely to this. Look at it out there. Um, we have on this, on, this, um, um, on this slide now, there's a couple of programs coming up, one of which is called Idea to Impact. It's five half day uh, workshops plus work, uh, fortnightly, and on the alternating fortnights, we'll give you feedback on your homework and your homework will primarily be developing customer insights. We'll also have you building business models and testing prototypes and stuff like that, but that's the core of it. Does that make sense? And we'll really get you practicing that. Thing is, you can all do it right now and you'll do pretty well and you'll get better at it if you practice it. If you come and do one of our workshops, you might get better a bit quicker. That's all I promise. Does that make sense? Um, uh, there are grant programs that we uh, run, Innovation Connect, Boosting Innovation, find out more, it's on the website. The Griffin Accelerator program is coming up. This is for high potential um, new businesses with a product in market or nearly in market that can really be accelerated, grow quickly, by working intensively with mentors and on a path to venture capital. The mentors will invest in some of the businesses. They're gonna, they're gonna effectively pay you to take their advice. Um, there's plenty of other things out there. And of course, network with each other, like we were just encouraging you to do with Helia, uh, support each other, uh, be part of the community, um, and do amazing things, right? That's, that's, that's what we're here for. Um, yes, uh, Irene's reminded me, First Wednesday Connect, every month we have a networking event where you can meet lots of people, right? You can go in easily in, in, into and out of small group conversations, much, much nicer than this Zoom format, actually. Uh, please come along, experience it, benefit from it. Um, Please, if you think you understand your customers, just remember puppies, go and test it a bit more, explore a new area, um, listen to, talk to, engage with those people who you can benefit, listen. You might, at early stage um, um, ideas, you can learn a lot, but established businesses do this all the time. Some of the smartest business people I know are people who are just naturally good at this. Uh, Jackie's asked about COVID restrictions. Obviously, we have to be very careful. By the way, I forgot to mention that our networking event was virtual. It's all online um, in, a, in an online format, but um, um, it, it, it's a challenge, isn't it? We can't necessarily, you know, not all the events we would like to happen or the in-person events we would like to do are uh, there. Uh, think about those people you want to benefit and, and you think, you'll know better than I, how can I engage with them, right? Uh, I generally steer people away from engaging them via social media, but some for some people that is the best way. You know, sort of digital natives, if they're Instagram generation and they like doing that sort of thing, then fine, do it. But engage, don't survey engage. That's the one thing I want you to do. That's where you get the rich unexpected insights. Um, hours almost up, unless anyone's got any other questions. Um, thank you very much for your really active engagement and participation. Uh, a pleasure talking to you. Um, engage with the programs, engage with each other, do amazing things, make the world a better place. Thanks a lot.
Oh, unless Peter wanted to add anything? No? No, all good. Thanks, Take everyone. Care.